I'll just give my brief introduction and welcome to this event. Um, I'm really, really thrilled to have Olena Stashkina sitting here next to me. Uh, my name is Amelia Glazer. I am a professor of literature here at UC San Diego and welcome to this UC wide symposium with Olena Stashkina. Um, which is co-sponsored by UCSD's Reese program and the UC-wide UCHRI, the Humanities Center that sponsors events, ideally to help us cross campuses and connect with one another, whether virtually or in person. So it's really a pleasure to have Olena Stiaschkina with us at UC San Diego today. Professor Stiaschkina is by training a historian uh, she taught Slavic history at the Vasil Stus uh, National University in Donetsk from 1993 mm -hmm. to 2015 until the occupation forced her out. She then taught at Mariupol State University. Um, and since 2016, she's been a senior research fellow at the Institute of History of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, which is based in Kyiv. Uh, she's the author of scholarly books as well as fiction. Around the time of the outbreak of the war, Olena shifted from writing in her native Russian to writing in her second language, Ukrainian. And this transition sometimes mm -hmm. becomes part of her texts. Um, her most recent books yeah. in translation, yeah. I will share with you. I'm just going to. People, there we go. Um, her most recent books in to appear in English translation have both been published by the Harvard Library of Ukrainian Literature. Ukraine War Love, a Donetsk Diary was translated by Anne Fisher. And this describes the occupation of Donetsk by Russia and Russian backed separatists beginning in 2014. Cecil the Lion Had to Die was translated by Dominique Hoffman. And thanks to Oleh Katsuba of Harvard's Ukrainian Library, we were able to procure early copies um, of these books. And our two respondents today, John Connolly and Taras Tsimbal, have had time to quickly read Ukraine War Love and will be asking questions based in part on this book. Um, I want to now introduce our two uh, panelists who will be in direct conversation with Olena for this panel. Professor John Connolly uh, teaches history of East Central Europe at UC Berkeley. He's been there since 1994. Uh, he received his bachelor's of science from Georgetown. He studied in Heidelberg as well as Krakow. He got his MA from the University of Michigan, his PhD from Harvard, and he's currently working on the history of German imperialism. Thank you so much for being here, John. And Taras Zimbel is a former associate professor of sociology and the vice dean at Taras Shevchenko National University in Kyiv. Uh, his research focus is on the historical sociology of Ukraine, as well as on spatial analysis. In 2023, he joined the faculty of global studies at UC Santa Barbara as an associate professor, where he is based currently and where he's teaching courses on geopolitics of the post-Soviet era um, area, as well as the methodology of spatial analysis. And his current research extends to authoritarian attitudes in Ukraine and Ukrainian forced migration to EU countries. So welcome, Taras. Thank you so much for being part of this panel. So we've asked Olena to say just a couple of words by way of introduction, and then we will have John and Taras take over uh, in the form of uh, a question and answer section. We'll have each of them pose a question that uh, Olena will answer, and we will then have time for all of you to uh, to pose your questions toward the end of the hour. Uh, the entire panel, we're giving an hour, but if it needs to go over for a little bit of, you know, coming up to the podium kind of conversation, we will leave the Zoom on in, in order to, to have that happen. So thanks so much to all of you for being here. Thank you, uh, thank you, thank you. And uh, uh, these are my main words uh, there and here. And I'm here uh, to say uh, it. And uh, I'm not going to be tired uh, to say thank you to Ukrainian army for my life, for life of my children, for European safety. 
I am not going to be tired to say thank you to the United States uh, of America, to all American people for your support, for your prayers, for your interest, thoughts, uh, for your strength, uh, for your solidarity. It's very important for us. And I know that my, uh, I know I realize mm, that my book tour uh, uh, already became a Thanksgiving tour. And I'm glad that that was my plan uh, to say thank you because uh, I uh, am um, aware that uh, if uh, we don't have uh, enough weapons, we will not have enough readers uh, because uh, the dead people don't read books. That is why uh, I would like to say thank you and uh, I have uh, done it with my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, and I'm Olena uh, Stashkina. I'm Ukrainian. I'm a historian, as uh, Amelia um, told before. And my uh, diary is a book um, uh, where I am a witness of uh, Russian invasion uh, to Ukraine in 2014. Uh, the war started in 2014. Uh, this is my um, my experience, and I think uh, it will be helpful as a historical source. Uh, I understand that uh, historical source needs uh, needs some critical approach, but uh, I believe that uh, it will be helpful. Uh, uh, there are many um, uh, stories. Uh, in my book, and uh, um, uh, among them, uh, there are funny, romantic, um, some um, sarcastic uh, stories, and yes, there are many sad stories or uh, stories of uh, the from the theater of absurdity. But this uh, theater of uh, absurdity start to kill us, to rape our women, to torture people. And that is why uh, now uh, the term uh, absurdity uh, means for me um, something different uh, than it meant in my past life. Uh, this book, um, I don't know, this, uh, this book uh, uh, wasn't uh, published in uh, Ukraine, wasn't published in Ukrainian uh, or in Russian. Um, it's only manuscript. Uh, manuscript. Uh, that is why uh, it uh, lives uh, now and it will live only uh, in English. And uh, that is a challenge for me. Uh, but uh, really, I cannot, uh, I, I know that um, uh, uh, I need to translate uh, it uh, into Ukrainian and then maybe, uh, maybe uh, pub to publish it, but um, but this diary uh, uh, is um, uh, painful for me. Uh, this diary for me is a um, um, bleeding body, really. And um, uh, even in English, uh, when, when I uh, read it, even in English, I, I feel pain. That is why um, that is why it's hard talk to me. And maybe two points, uh, uh, two points. Uh, uh, this is uh, diary uh, is about un unconditional love. Uh, and uh, is about what does it mean uh, Ukrainian nationalism now? To be Ukrainian nationalist, to be Ukra a Ukrainian nationalist is uh, um, to feel that all people uh, are uh, in the basement or who wakes who wakes up uh, in the middle of the night with nightmare or who will never wake up uh, who um, are killed by Russians to feel that uh, these all children are my own our own that uh, my point that's our point really and Ukraine in this way of thinking Ukraine um, is children, uh, is a child. And to protect it, to love it, uh, it is a privilege and uh, an instinct on other way. And uh, it's a happiness to be Ukrainian and to protect, to defend, to fight for, for it. 
for sure i i uh, can say but uh, if you, you know, feel ukraine as uh, as he okay <laughs> Uh, and uh, the uh, second point uh, um, I would like to um, uh, to stress uh, is about uh, transition, uh, my transition and transition of my colleagues, my friends from uh, Soviet um, to uh, Ukrainian identity. And um, it's some uh, it, it was and it is something like um, transition from, uh, Dostoevsky, Little Man, to Virgil or Katlerevsky, N.A. N.S. N.A. Buf Parubak Matorny. It's about transition from uh, fear, cowardice, uh, uncertainty to freedom, to values, to dignity. Um, I um, adore Aeneas, who was able um, to, to be free, to stay free, and to recreate his world, to uh, rebuild um, his uh, city, to uh, start new civilization. And that is why uh, I think uh, it's all my... Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'll turn the uh, floor over to John Connolly to ask the first question, and then we'll take it from there back and forth between John and Taras. Yeah, thank you, and you, you can hear me, yeah? Um, yes. Coming through. Yes, yeah, so thank you so much for giving me a chance to read this, this, this wonderful book, uh, which I plan to use in teaching in the future. I have taught courses using first-person perspectives on authoritarian, totalitarian societies, and this fits right in because it's about the moments um, in which a relatively free society, a free society became less than free. In fact, it became a place dominated by fear and by a foreign occupation power. And it's very, it's, it's powerfully told with lots of anecdotes. And it's actually great that it's by a historian who's also uh, a gifted writer. So it, it couldn't be better for teaching. And it arrives at a very important point that one of the things that's interesting about the book, um, Elena, is that you actually knew some of the people who, who joined the other side who actually became part of the support of the occupiers. Uh, there were people that you taught, people that you knew from your own uh, education, your schools. So you know them very, very well. And you've had insight, I think, into that kind of mentality that's that's very unusual. So my question, my my first question is, is, is about people who opted for Russian occupation. Uh, these were people who were uh, citizens of Ukraine, Ukrainians by that definition. Um, and they were openly abandoning freedom, um, democracy, uh, doing so willingly, it would seem. And um, you know that there was a book by Erich Fromm a long time ago called uh, Flight from Escape from Freedom, it was called actually, about the mentality of people who actually chose to live under authoritarian and dictatorial rule. Um, so how, what is it about democracy and freedom that these people... Uh, didn't like that they were repelled by. Um, can you give any insights about about this choice? It was a choice after all. I mean, some people opted and acted in fear, but they were also refusing the kind of thing you you were just describing, which is love for their country. So how do how do you how do you approach that? Um, I will try to uh, uh, to answer in English, and then uh, if uh, I need. Uh, an assistance, okay. Uh, I, 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 I ask, I will ask. Um, I, uh, I, I thought uh, about um, uh, it a lot about this question, and uh, I think it this is main question of uh, this world. Why uh, one people, one part of uh, citizens, chose to be free uh, to 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 be uh, dignity to be in uh, the circle of uh, solidarity and other uh, didn't. And um, uh, I have uh, only um, hypothesis, uh, uh, not answers. And first uh, of them is about, uh, about feeling of being, a uh, Hamlet question, uh, to be or not to be. In the Soviet system, this question was um, uh, um, con uh, considered as a uh, as joke, really. Uh, uh, no one uh, 
uh, took it seriously uh, uh, to be or not to be, to, to drink or not to drink, to beat or not to beat, this way of thinking. And I think that um, this uh, to be was a huge challenge, was a dangerous challenge for Soviet system because being uh, is, um, uh, is about choice is about uh, individuality, in individual choice, personal choice. And not being is about collectivism, is about obedient uh, behavior, is about a service and so on. Uh, that is why uh, I, I think that when I would like to be Ukrainian, when I know that I'm Ukrainian, I chose being. And when they choose to be Russian, they chose to be obedient, um, uh, obedient um, uh, and no, not personal, uh, um, not active uh, persons and passive maybe. I have, uh, I have had, uh, had a colleague and when a Russian had started uh, this invasion in Donetsk, he shouted um, at me, I, <laughs> something like that i know that i am a zero i know that many of our colleagues are a zero too and i know that all need we all need dig it one and that is way when one zero 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 become a uh, one thousand and russia is our dig it one uh, it it sounded so strange and so stupid, really. And then she shout, uh, he shouted, and I know you are not zero. Uh, and your friend, you you are not zero. That is why you couldn't understand us. And I think uh, it's not about jealous. It's about being or not being. Uh, because Russia proposes and proposed the idea of greatness. Um, uh, this is a false idea, we know it. But but uh, idea of greatness is an uh, idea of uh, irresponsibility. And personal idea, which Ukraine proposes, proposed and, and will propose to uh, uh, its citizens, it's idea of a personal choice and about responsibility and about freedom and about values. That is why something uh, between zero and ticket one. Something like some. It's uh, abyss uh, where uh, all uh, pro-Russian sentiments fall down. I'm going to go ahead and add the spotlight on Taras and we can go back and forth uh, to, to continue to ask questions. That was, yeah, I'm still, yeah. I'm going to process that answer for oh. a long time. Oh. Oh. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to say uh, thank you to everyone uh, who contributed to uh, the appearance of this book in English. I had the privilege of uh, reading an advanced copy of it just a few days before this uh, presentation uh, so I was uh, thrilled to have it uh, on paper and uh, uh, to read it uh, from the first to the last page uh, I enjoyed it uh, a lot and um, I think it's a very important uh, uh, publication and I'm very glad that uh, Olena both uh, wrote it and uh, had the, the courage to uh, bring it to the publisher um, especially to um, publisher in a, in the English speaking world, uh, it's important uh, to uh, bring this book to wider audiences uh, um, as um, as an important document uh, of this uh, uh, of the events that are uh, unfolding in Ukraine uh, in order to show that uh, the war in Ukraine started in 2014, not uh, just a year ago. Um, that uh, that period of war, the uh, eight years that lasted from 2014 to 22, uh, were a um, terrible time for uh, Ukrainians. 
And uh, this book is great in showing the depth of darkness uh, that is uh, that characterizes the Russian invasion of Ukraine from the very beginning. When I was reading it, uh, I uh, I couldn't uh, stand, um, uh, I couldn't avoid uh, comparing uh, this book and this uh, experience to the diaries uh, coming from the Second World War and uh, from the Nazi occupied uh, places uh, in Ukraine. And uh, in literary terms, this book is so good that uh, after finishing it, uh, I had a nightmare which I didn't have for for about uh, a year. Um, war related uh, nightmare. It brought to life all the memories that uh, I also had of uh, the Russian invasion, but um, in um, the invasion of twenty uh, twenty two. So, um, I think that uh, the importance of uh, this diary. Uh, transcends uh, the significance of this diary uh, transcends the temporal and the spatial constraints uh, of uh, its writing. Um, it emerged uh, um, from the right time and uh, place uh, and uh, touches uh, on the story of uh, how a new act in the um, very uh, long historical drama of the development of uh, Ukrainian identity has unfolded unfolded uh, drama uh, which uh, in which acts last for centuries and actors uh, live their real lives um, uh, this diary culminates uh, with the phrase that ukraine has already been born uh, in me uh, and uh, in others this is a, a quote from from the book so uh, i want to ask a question more of a philosophical or uh, sociological kind uh, which refers to uh, this particular phrase. So let me repeat it. Uh, Ukraine has already been born in me and in others. Um, you develop this sense of birth from your network of relatives, friends, and uh, acquaintances, uh, mostly from Donetsk and its surroundings, and uh, mostly Russian-speaking at the time of writing. Uh, the diary, therefore, uh, documents a birth of a clear and dear concept of Ukraine in this um, community, uh, which came to a hard-learned revelation that they were Ukrainians. Irrespective of the language they spoke, most of them spoke Russian, the genetics the genetics they bore in their bodies, most of them had some um, Russian uh, or um, ancestors or any, uh, coming from other uh, parts of the former Soviet Union. So, and also irrespective of the faith uh, that uh, uh, they professed. This revelation represents a major historical transformation in the nature of Ukrainian identity, which traditionally relied on Christian orthodoxy and uh, later on the Ukrainian language uh, as its mainstays and uh, markers, enabling it to maintain its symbolic borders uh, in the face of uh, uh, its expansionist neighbors. Christian orthodoxy has long been deposed as a defining feature of Ukrainian identity uh, due to its commonality with Russian identity, and uh, uh, its decline in the age of uh, secularism. Uh, Language-based identity dominated Ukrainian thinking for the last two centuries. However, uh, as you chronicled uh, in the diary, uh, language was overshadowed by a different sense of uh, identity during uh, the time of writing, a value-based identity which is still to be uh, conceptualized. So what made the community of Donetsk and uh, Donbass at large the to find uh, their uh, inner Ukrainianness. What was this Ukrainianness made of? Uh, it can be the language they speak, the God they believe in, or the right they observe. Uh, it can hardly be the passport uh, and the citizenship they possess. Uh, many of them felt the drive to switch to the Ukrainian language only after they had Ukraine born, uh, to quote you, or discovered in them. Uh, their self-discovery of inner Ukrainianism, therefore, uh, preceded their attempted linguistic self-Ukrainization uh, and was fueled by the confrontation and antagonism which unfolded in uh, 2014. Uh, this conflict made them realize their distinctiveness from the identity the invasion sought to impose upon them. So what was the foundation of uh, this uh, uh, newly discovered uh, Ukrainian identity? Um, 
I dare to describe this identity in terms articulated in your diary as based on opposition to the concept of a little man, on dignity, critical thinking, and accepting uh, responsibility rather than blindly following uh, orders. It treats community as a network rather than a hierarchy. Community membership as an association rather than an administered mob. Uh, by envisioning motherland, that is community as a child, rather than uh, an authoritative mother, this identity apply, implies a bottom-up uh, community emergence instead of its uh, top-down construction. It is an identity which emphasizes the rules of community building and its relationship to an individual, rather than rules of grammar or liturgy. An identity uh, which can be shared by people of diverse backgrounds, uh, including a president of uh, Jewish uh, origin, a Muslim minister, a Russian speaking fight Russian speaking fighters uh, who are numerous uh, on the front line and the uh, Ukrainian speaking uh, majority. So and they all are considered as uh, uh, belonging to this identity as long as they adhere to the same concept of uh, community. This identity signals a shift from ethnic to supra-ethnic uh, civil nationalism in Ukrainian collective uh, consciousness. These are my assumptions. Uh, how can you, as an author, eyewitness, and historian, describe this new Ukrainian identity, uh, which has been forged by the experience of uh, occupation and war? Uh, or, uh, to put it in another way, how this experience, which you have so aptly and tellingly captured uh, in your diary, shape the future of Ukrainian national identity? Is this transformative journey from traditional markets to a more inclusive value-based understanding of what it means to be Ukrainian real? Or uh, uh, how do you see, uh, how do you see uh, its prospects? Um, you also uh, described in your, um, in your introduction uh, to this uh, discussion, uh, your experience as a, a transition transition uh the the uh, the um, impression that i had from the diary that it wasn't a transition it wasn't a it, it was a discovery it was rather a discovery that there was this dormant ukrainian identity uh, in people like you and uh, like uh, many others uh, whom you mentioned uh, in uh, your diary and um, this I, this Ukrainian identity uh, was uh, part of uh, uh, their self uh, understanding uh, for a long time, uh, regardless of the language that they spoke. Uh, however, they came to uh, discovery of this identity uh, only now. So, can you please comment on this and uh, answer uh, these uh, questions? Uh, um, uh, on the basis of uh, your experience, uh, which you both is described in the book and which you had uh, afterwards um, in the course of the eight years or even uh, nine years uh, which followed uh, uh, the period which is described uh, in your diary. Thank you. Um, uh, if you don't mind, uh, let me be only an author today because as a historian, I should be more um, proper and correct and uh, work uh, with argument and evidence. That is why the role of uh, um, the author is more convenient and um, less responsible, maybe. But uh, joke aside, uh, uh, identity, uh, um, I, uh, I, I didn't think about it uh, as in this term really, um, but now uh, uh, I'm ready uh, to, uh, uh, to tell you about uh, the first level of uh, uh, the first level of um, uh, feeling of uh, uh, that war. And uh, this first level was a body. And uh, uh, we have a, a guerrilla group. Uh, I was a <laughs> guerrilla group. I uh, told uh, this morning uh, about this experience uh, uh, here. Uh, and uh, our guerrilla group um, 
uh, was full of very different persons, uh, very different uh, poor and rich, uh, adult and young, uh, sad and uh, uh, funny, uh, serious and um, very different. And one thing that uh, we uh, uh, was uh, uh, similar uh, was a Russian uh, language. Really, we were Russian language uh, speakers, but it but uh, each of us uh, has uh, roots has roots from uh, Ukraine, from Russia, from Greek, from Jew, from Armenia, from uh, Belarus, from Lithuania, from Georgia, from Korea as well. We has. Uh, a small group of uh, Korean from the beginning of the 20th century. And part of this uh, Korean uh, people was were a member of our guerrilla group. And uh, uh, the first thing uh, which we uh, were um, discussing uh, alone uh, every, maybe every day, uh, it was um, the feeling that we could not breathe. And uh, every day, more and more, we couldn't make an inhale. We uh, felt that air is uh, was not enough, and we our our body is going to die. And the second thing was a um, disgusting, a feeling of absolutely disgusting. Um, uh, towards to Russian language, to Russian faces, to Russian movements, to Russian ideas, disgusting in my mouth, in my throat. I I was sick really, and um, I understand that sometimes our body is smarter than our head and our brain because. Uh, because um, uh, our body cannot uh, eat a duck sheet, but our head, our brain can eat something like sheet or Kremlin propaganda. And uh, both this feeling of uh, uh, without uh, air, uh, out of air and disgusting were uh, the fundament of the next feeling and next thinking. And this next feeling and next, next thinking worry about freedom, worry about values, worry about uh, dignity, worry about solidarity, worry about we are people. I am a person. I am, I am, and this is my point, and the uh, are, and this is the point, and we are ready to be, and we are ready to fight for, for our being. And then um, the third uh, level was understanding that uh, Ukraine, it is about sleeping love, something normal love. You know, many romantic stories when, when she and he uh, were classmates, were friends, and uh, they did not know that uh, they are in love, that uh, they are uh, soulmates, and uh, Ukraine for us uh, was and is something like that. Now uh, it is not sleeping love; it is very waking up love. But uh, for at that time, it was something like like uh, normal, like like an air, like an uh, our city, our country, and and uh, love by default, and we understood they they we need to wake it up to uh to um uh, say out loud we love you you we belong uh you we are ukrainian and that is why we fought for this waking up in our city and then uh it's it's a good word uh, discovery yes it it was felt like discovery, but then um, after these year years, I understood that it's not discovery uh, in full sense. It's about returning home. It's not about transition. It's about returning home. 
because uh, I'm Ukrainian and I was Ukrainian and my parents were Ukrainian. Instead, uh, um, uh, uh, despite uh, uh, the fact that they uh, were speaking in Russian, because in the critical moment, in a um, crucial moment of their life, uh, they spoke in Ukrainian. They um, get fighting in Ukrainian. They um, confessed um, in something something about sin or about love in Ukrainian. And uh, it's very important. They uh, um, uh, send songs in Ukrainian, only in Ukrainian. Uh, that is why uh, it, it is um, uh, it is feeling now like returning home. Oh, I'm at home. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm returning. Please hug me. Something like that. Uh, because for me, uh, you know, uh, Ukraine is, uh, is in a life. Uh, our literature has a, a long uh, tradition of magician uh, thinking. Um, that is why uh, um, I can let myself to continue this tradition. That is why for me, Ukraine is a life and I can... Um, Talk to talk to her for me. Her or is uh, as you prefer he, he or him. It's okay. Pass the mic back to John. John, you're muted. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of the most fascinating uh, statements I've ever heard. I think in my study of the region between Germany and Russia for many years. Um, it reminds me that there was a question that was posed to the Polish poet Zbigniew Herbert, who um, was an unusual case in the time of Stalinism because he didn't engage in socialist realism. At least that that's that was his reputation. And afterwards, people asked him, "Well, why didn't you submit to the uh, you know the correct Orthodox Stalinist thinking?" And he said, "You know, deep down, it was a question of taste." Kwestia smaku is what he said and it's it's a i haven't thought of this for a long time but when you talked about your body in a sense being repelled by what was entering uh the region and uh finding a sense of community among like-minded like feeling people who felt the same way that's extraordinary actually and it also reminds me of something that i've been thinking um um since last february which is that we're witnessing a revolution in ukraine of a very unusual kind because it's uh, as Tara said, it's um, it's it 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 is in some ways uh, a transition to a different kind of community, but it's not the kind of national community that we're used to in in the region, which is often thought of as being cultural and ethnic. It's more than that, and and you've stated it uh, with great eloquence. Um, I uh, was asked to, and and by the way, you, Ukraine, I think in that sense also reminds me more of, of revolutions that we know from France and the United States and, and and the thirteen colonies in the eighteenth century. It's not like revolutions that we've seen in the twentieth century in in Eastern Europe. It's not like anything after World War One. It's not like after World War Two. It's very special, you know. And it's it's great that you remind us that it actually the the genesis of this goes back to two thousand fourteen and earlier. But the genealogies are personal, as as, as you said. Uh, but I, maybe you could say a few more words before we pass on to um, the audience as a whole, which is uh, what, what it what it was immediately. What what's your sense uh, as an author, if you can say any more about this, about what it was that impelled people uh, to resist um, at the at, at at the at the cost of their lives, right? So this would would have been immediately evident to people that you knew. Uh, what what was it within them? In 2014, uh, but also later, what what was it that caused them to uh, to say no? And 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 is 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 there anything more that you can say about that? Because it's an extraordinary uh, event, I think, on the background of European history, um, as a, maybe more as an author than as a historian. You said that there's this distinction, right? In other words, what is what is your what does your intuition tell you um, as an author that maybe a historian couldn't 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 write? Thank you. Um, uh, I, I don't know uh, really. I don't know <laughs> really not, uh, anything. But um, I, I can I, I can tell about myself, about my experience and the experience of my friends. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, 
our experience in uh, 2014 uh, 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 is or was uh, similar to experience uh, which we had in uh, February 2022, uh, because uh, it was uh, the same feeling. And as for me, I realized that uh, I, I cannot live in uh, under Russian occupation. I, I cannot uh, br breathe really. And if uh, uh, I must die, uh, it's okay. Uh, because it was, um, uh, uh, wasn't a, a vain victims. Uh, let it be my sacrifice. I'm ready to do it. I, 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 I'm not ready live my uh, only one life under uh, absurd cruelty, ruthless and false uh, ideas. I don't want this life. And my friends told the same. It, it is, um, uh, I know that I, our body must um, stop us, must say uh, uh, to uh, us, uh, no, 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 it, it's, it's a bad way. You must be obedient, you must be um, calm down and so on. But um, disgusting was so high level. Uh, I, I couldn't live with um, uh, this poor poison in my blood. Uh, I, I think um, I think that in February two thousand twenty-two we felt the same. We felt the same, and uh, only one uh, difference was uh, we uh, 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 in February uh, uh, we. Uh, already knew that uh, we must kill our children first uh, if uh, a Russian uh, mm, came uh, to Kiev because we must protect them. We must uh, uh, mm, mustn't let uh, um, to to rape uh, them. That is why. Uh, that is why uh, this readiness uh, live uh, in freedom or die for freedom, uh, uh, as for me, is very unusual, uh, really unusual, because um, it's not about um, fanatism. It's not about something uh, sui suicidal ideas. It's about dignity. And as uh, of now, dignity is higher is more important than life. So perhaps we'll have one more follow-up question from Taras, um, and then depending on the timing, we can open it up to questions from all of you. Yep. Um, so um, this question is uh, concerns uh, your knowledge of uh, Russian culture and uh, Russian uh, literature. Um, on a few occasions uh, in the diary, you appeal to um, Russian culture, which was an uh, uh, important uh, part of your, um, um, of upbringing. your upbringing, yes, of your knowledge. Um, so while reading uh, the diary, I had a deja vu feeling, a uh, deja vu feeling which uh, connected this diary to the diaries coming from uh, German Lebensraum, uh, in particular two diaries uh, or one diary by Irina Horoshunova, uh, which was uh, written by a uh, uh, secondary school teacher in the Kiev under Nazi occupation and memoirs by Anatoly Kuznetsov, who documented Babi Yar events under uh, the Nazi occupation as well. And um, uh, it occurred to me then that there is indeed uh, some kind of affinity between their writings and, and yours. Uh, your diary uh, comes from uh, the place which can be called Operativne Prostranstvo. Uh, for those who have no background in Russian uh, short uh, explanation, uh, Operativne Prostranstvo, which can be uh, translated uh, into English as operational space, or operational area, it's a Russian military and political concept which uh, treats a certain area in terms of its uh, military usefulness uh, while completely obliterating its people uh, from their place. 
uh, and in both cases, in case of Lebensraum and uh, Operativne uh, Prostranstvo, human geography is reduced to physical geography. And the uh, people are overshadowed by uh, this impersonal uh, space. Uh, Donbass was and continues to be treated by the Russian leadership as an uh, Operativne Prostranstvo, seen as instrumental in uh, pursuing the uh, narrow vision of national security. You, you make reference to this kind of blindness uh, blindness uh, on several occasions, blindness of uh, the uh, Russian uh, leadership, Russian culture, uh, particularly uh, when you comment on uh, Russia's inability to see both Ukraine and the Russian people. Uh, this is a long cultivated inability, which is definitely rooted in political practices and uh, in, in culture. Um, based on the ideas of uh, post-colonial studies, we can assume that Russian high culture and literature are implicated in the construction and promotion of this dehumanizing approach to uh, geography and place. Uh, you have mentioned how Russian literature has stripped ordinary Russians of any responsibility for implementation of orders from above, uh, because the little men are not uh, supposed to have uh, any opinion of their own and exercise any discretion. Uh, can you also trace the literary sources of this dehumanizing, dehumanization of uh, geography or the blindness of uh, blindness to the people who inhabit a certain place? Are there any uh, literary roots uh, or cultural roots uh, in this political blindness? blindness? Thank you for your question. And um, uh, I need your, uh, your help in translation, okay? Uh, because um, uh, I would like to say uh, something uh, different, uh, uh, not um, exactly about your question, but uh, some um, about comparison. Uh, Turgenev, Mumu, uh, and uh, oh, e, um, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Stone, Hijina, uh, Dyatka Toma. Um, so Turgenev's Mumu and Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. At the same time, uh, it was written at the same time, at the, uh, the same year. Uh, um, and uh, uh, the um, Gerasim was uh, ordered to draw... To, be, to, to drown it. To, to, to draw yeah. uh, his favorite, his lovable dog, Mumu. Uh, Herasim uh, is mute, mute. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, on other side, uh, Uncle uh, Tom was ordered to beat uh, um, his uh, friends on plantation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there is a similar choice. And Herasim chose to drone a lovable dog. Only one soul who loved him and uncle tom chose to um to be to be free uh from sin to be free from uh betrayal to be human that is why uh russian culture um often uh proposes uh very simple and a very cruel way uh, of being. Uh, you are a good man. Uh, and we, as a student, um, uh, when we started um, this story about Hirasim, we must uh, feel sympathize to Hirasim. But he is a criminal. He is ruthless bastard. He killed a dog, dog, little dog, lovely little dog, and we must sympathize him. Mm -hmm. um, that is why this way uh, of thinking of Russian culture forms um, a, um, enormous geography of violent enormous places where every uh, each Gerasim must kill Mumu or must kill a child or must kill a grandmother or some Raskolnikov or something like that. Uh, that is why uh, 
Russian culture forms a, ge a geography of violence and cruelty. Uh, and um, uh, uh, <laughs> I am not a uh, voter for canceling of Russian culture because it's not my business, really. Uh, it's not my interest. Um, but I think that Russian culture uh, culture needs something like quarantine. 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 Yeah, quarantine. And that is why uh, something different uh, from your uh, question, but I would like to say it just. Yeah, we, we have about 10 minutes remaining in the hour and I, I wanna open it up to questions from others in the audience. So please go ahead and you can put up your yellow hand or, um, or you can put a question in the chat or write in the chat, I have a question. Um, or if you can't sort out any of those things, sometimes phones make that difficult. You can just unmute yourself and say, I have a question. And if, if we don't have, have oh yes. Very Stephen. kind people. Malina. Okay. Yes, Ma Malina, please, Stefanovska. Please, please introduce yourselves as well and uh, go ahead and unmute yourself, Malina. Hey, I'm Malina Stefanovska. I'm from Yugos ex Yugoslavia and I'm a professor at UCLA. And uh, I was wondering, because your experience is not exactly similar, but post dates our ex experience of exploding the country by some 10, 20 years. Um, I had a question and, and like a, a punctual question. Um, when you speak about the Russian culture, somebody or a culture that demands ruthlessness, but isn't that the same exalted vocabulary that you use when you say we're going to kill our children uh, in order to not be Russian. And I'm asking that because when we had this explosion, I was not on any side I couldn't be. I mean, I only felt the terrible pain on both sides. And by now, I still feel it. And it is uh, related to language and related to what is mine. So I'm not Serbian, I'm not anything, I'm everything. And I still feel that every part of that ex country is mine. Mine, not in any political terms, not even in linguistic terms, but in terms of some kind of past love that I'm not going to abandon. So yes, you know, Croatia is mine, Macedonia is mine, but only in poetic terms, not in any other terms. Um, and I do feel a huge nostalgia about which I wrote for the languages and the common commonality that we used to have and that does not exist. So I was just wondering, for you, it's not a time of mourning for that, for the Soviet Union. I understand that. But uh, do you think there is a mourning that will be necessary for your own mother tongue or Russian insofar it, as it was a mother tongue. I don't know. That's my question. Um, uh, you know, uh, yes, uh, I told these cruel uh, words about how we must protect our children. And um, it's not about literature. What is my point? It's not about literature. It's about life. And uh, you know, uh, we um, in Ukraine we have some flash mob uh, with um, uh, "I am a cruel Ukrainian writer." Uh, it was uh, something uh, like uh, an answer uh, to um, accusation uh, of our uh, um, language of hate. Maybe uh, uh, I don't know, but uh, I am not going to. Um, uh, to say sorry about my position because it's my position and, uh, and I repeat, uh, it's not about literature. It's about uh, a terrible practice. It's about my children. It's about my mother choice. And uh, 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 for, uh, as of now and uh, um, as uh, about my life, um, I uh, um, haven't have no see a gray zone, uh, and I am not going to see a gray zone. I see the cruel enemies, 
and I see Ukrainian citizens and mine uh, is uh, the space of Ukrainian world and not mine uh, is the space of Russian world. And this is my way uh, uh, of waging this war. And if it sounds cruel, I am sorry only for sounding, not for sense. Uh, thank you. I'd like to um, read a question that Professor Ihor Lilo has put into the chat. Ihor is a visiting uh, professor of history here at UC San Diego. He writes, Dear Olena, if you had to briefly explain to Americans what the Russian world is, what term uh, based on your personal experience, would you use to describe it? How would you describe the Russian, this, you know, Russian, uh, yeah. Russian world is um, about... Uh, uh, Feel free to, to unmute uh, and clarify, Ihor, if you'd like to. Uh, yeah. I have, uh, I have, uh, um, I have no enough uh, um, correct and polite words, really. I have only cursed, um, and uh, it's not good for me. And um, as an author from Ukraine, uh, Russian world uh, is a world of killers, serial killers and maniacs. And uh, it was, and it is, and it will be the world of killers and maniacs. Their comments and questions. And if not, I might turn it back to uh, to John. I don't know if you'd like to pose a last question before we um, we have to say goodbye and, and thank our guest. No, I, I, I don't have a um, question, but I, I was reminded in what Tara said that there, there's, a, there's a long chapter in Czesław Miłosz's um, autobiographical reminiscences, uh, Native Realm about Russia. And he talks, you have to read this if you haven't read it, but he talks at length about Russian culture as having an old Ma Manichaean uh, tendency to it. That is because there's no perfection is possible. Every cruelty is is, is permitted on, on the, in this world, right? It's it's an ancient kind of Christian heresy that uh, Miłosz, who knew Russia very well for, as from childhood, he he recognized, and he was not a bigot. You have, yeah. you have to also emphasize, Eleni, you're not speaking out of bigotry. You're speaking in some ways out, out of um encounter right a personal encounter with a with a different kind of world i mean russian world is exactly the right word for it in a way right but uh and when i when i mentioned this i'm not going to mention a name at a, at a conference of a colleague in, in russian history he was very upset that you know that that, that 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 this idea would be proposed about 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 russian russian culture but it's you know it, it's based you know that miwos when he's when he taught at berkeley do you know what his most famous course was Dostoevsky. Yeah. So he taught Russian, he taught precisely Russian culture. He lived in that world. He lived at the edge of the world, right? And by the way, Miwash always called himself Lithuanian. I mean, he obviously operated in, he didn't speak Lithuanian, but he, he operated, but he thought of himself as, as being a person of, of, of small Europe, you know? And so, I don't know, another person to read, obviously, and I guess I'll sign off with this, and you, you'll agree with me, I think, is Milan Kundera. Yeah. And I think what, what's happened in the last... 10 years at, at most is that, um, you know, Ukraine has taken um, by its own courage and determination a full step into the world of Central Europe, as described by Milan Kundera. It's exactly what's happened. But it's it's fascinating because it's not, it's it's cultural, but it's, it's, it's transcends culture in ways that you've described with great eloquence. So um, anyway, thanks very much for, for your work. And uh, I'll sign off from Berkeley with that. I want to thank all of you for being here and on behalf of myself and also my colleague Professor Martha Lampland who is the director of our Reese program um, thank you Olena for being here and thank you to the UCHRI for sponsoring what I hope will be uh, not the last um, Reese related multi-campus uh, gathering whether on Zoom or in person so thank you all we'll leave the Zoom on for a few minutes if we want to have a little bit more informal conversation um, I think we can we can do that. Um, this will be this has been recorded, and I believe we can post it on the UCSD website. Um, but we can also send copies to other campuses. With all my mistakes. Yeah, and. <laughs>
Thank you, Elena, John, and Tara. That was just a marvelous discussion. Very, very powerful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for invitation, for participation, for your support. First of all, we need more weapons, you know. Please <laughs> know about it. And we are grateful and we will be grateful forever, really. Yeah, thank you for the event and uh, for invited, uh, inviting me. Well, it was a, also a um, uh, good pretext for getting an advanced copy and a free copy of this book, uh, which I loved so much. Academics will do anything for free books. It's amazing. Thank you so much <laughs> to both of you. Us and great work, Chief. Yeah, thank you. Yet unpublished. Yet unpublished. <laughs>